Dear Lord, bless the sick, bless the shut in, bless the homeless. And most of all, thank you for blessing us. Yes. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I saw an advertisement this week about, and, and Elder John and I were talking about this this morning, about religion. I got a flyer in the mail, and I'm a poor artist. But at this new church I was invited to, it says, Santa rocks at, and I won't fill in the blank, and it's got picture Santa Claus playing an electric guitar. Oh. And they've got earplugs there, because when you walk in, you have, they have to hand you an earplug. Oh so my. this is Christian. This is religion. I, I'm tired of religion. Amen. It's about Amen. what John said. It's a relationship. Yeah. Amen. You know, <laughs> why would you drag Santa and a steel electric guitar with a huge amp and earplugs and over uh, miss the gospel message? It just irritates me, but I'll, I'll get off my high horse at this. You know, I, I spent the last couple of weeks and I found a serious mistranslation in the Bible. And it's probably in your Bible. And I'll turn to Matthew 25 here a little bit. Matthew 25, 21. When I saw this, I go, I can't believe this. This is one of the most serious mistranslations in the Bible. It's in the King James. It's in the ESV. It's even in the Geneva Study Bible. Uh, it's in the NIV. Only the NASB Bible found that and got this right. Really? One translation. I know there's a few others. Uh, but did you know that you will find the Greek word for slay in the New Testament 150 times. Most of those times is translated servant. Wrong. Read your Greek. I know the King James uh, translators did not want to make it offensive. Well, we don't want to put in, we don't like the word slave. Slave is just so, uh, it, it, you know, it, it sounds, the annotation is so bad and, and, it, and it sounds like, uh, you know, this is sounds, it's too offensive. You know, when the time the Bible was written, the King James Bible and the Geneva Bible, slavery was rampant around the world. So, I want you to look at the surprising thing about when you read the word servant, especially in the parables, it says slave. It never says servant. Servant and slave are totally two different things. And I tell you why. Because a slave... And a servant are huge differences. <coughs> a slave, this is what he owns. Nothing. Zero. A servant gets paid. Whatever it is. And he goes home. A slave can't go nowhere. You're my property. I own you. Servant, you're done. Your day's <coughs> over. Punch the clock. Go home. It's good. I want to be a slave. Yes. I don't want to be a servant. And I'll tell you why. It's amazing. Because this mis mistranslation of the word servant is wrong. And it's actually the Greek word is doulos. You will find the word slave in every parable that you read. The next time you read a parable... <coughs> Read it this way, and I'm going to turn to this. By the way, this is the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, and I'm going to read 21 specifically. But God gives us talents. To one man, he gave five talents. To the other man, he gave two talents. To the other man, he gave one talent. They all doubled their investment, except one. He was like me when I got my... Uh, a Christmas toy one time and my, my brothers and sisters wanted it and I hid it, I buried it. Well, it ruined it. I buried what had been given me as a gift and it was useless. God expects the talent that he's given us to use and to double it and, and maybe some triple it, some of them are, but they were wise stewards in, the, in Matthew 24 verses 24 through 25, I'll start with that first. Matthew 25, verse 24. He who had received one talent came forward, 
Master, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here is what's yours. It's rotted. It's no good. The slave who was also, by the way, a steward, buried what he didn't use. So his master says, verse 26, you wicked and slothful, lazy, whatever, slave. This, yours probably says servant. Yes. That's wrong. It says, you wicked, slothful, slave. It's not a servant. Because if you're wicked and, and slothful servant, you just get fired. If you're a wicked and slothful servant, slave, you die. Okay, that's a huge difference. We are slaves. We are not servants. The only time that the word servant is used is when I'm relating to you. I want to serve my brother. I want to be a servant to my sister. I want to serve others that I can, uh, sh you know, show them what Christ, he's servant. He is a servant. He came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here's what the master said. You knew I would reap, in verse 25 through, I'm sorry, Matthew 25, 26 through 29. Here's what the master said to this one guy that buried his talent. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I scattered no seed. Listen to this. You ought to have invested your money? No. My money with the bankers. And in coming, I would have received with what was mine at my own interest. This is not ours. I got nothing. John said that, he said, he gave, said something this morning that was very profound to me when we spoke. The most precious thing we have is a relationship with Christ. Amen. And having hunger and seeking for him, not needs, not things like that are going to burn up. He showed, pulled out of his pocket some money and a credit card. And this is all going to burn up. Besides, it's not his, it's not mine, and, and what I own is not mine. Amen. So he says, take that talent from that worthless servant, slave, I should say, they aren't falling for it, and give it to him who has ten. You know, Jesus doesn't say to the one with five talents who turned him into ten, well done, now good, and more faithful servant. No, he just says the faith. They're both rewards for both. Well done, good, and more faithful? No, faithful servant. He tells the one who had two talents and doubled the talents, well done, you did a little better, faithful. No, he says the same thing. He doesn't expect somebody to give him two talents to make ten. We've all been given talents at different levels, but he expects us to use that and double that. Jesus knows some are given less. He knows that. But if they use what's been given to them, they're both faithful, both the one that doubled to five and one that doubled to two. They're both faithful because they used it. They understood that they were not theirs. It was Jesus said, my money. Because everything is God's. I got nothing that is not from God. First Corinthians 4, 7. What do you have that you did not receive? Zero. Nothing. That's what a slave uh, knows. He understands that everything he owns, even his own life, is nothing. It's not his. Did you know, here's another interesting fact. In the Greek word for Lord, now get this, 750 times, it took me a while to go through the, the it took me, I spent probably more time than I probably should have, but I thought, no, it was worth it. 750 times the word Lord is, it is from the Greek word kyrios. It's spelled K-Y-I-O-S. Curious. You know what it means? Master. Owner. That's the Greek translation for Lord. If he's your Lord, then he's your master. If he's your Lord, you're his slave. You're not his servant. He owns you. He owns me. Lock, stock, and barrel. I got nothing. One guy, famous guy, that I can't, I wish I could remember the martyr's name, but he was a, a saint's name. He lost all of his house. He had this nice house, and he it was not really rich. And he burned up, and people came up and tried to help him. So what are you going to do now? And he goes, 
I don't know what God's going to do now. He's going to have to find me a new home. This was not my home. That's how he was content. He realized what he lost was not his to begin with. Amen. You cannot be, Jesus is called Lord and Matt, Lord, actually. You cannot be Lord, which means master. That's the first meaning of the word Lord, master. And then next, owner. He cannot be master. He cannot be master unless he owns slaves. He owns us. And you know what? At one time, you're a slave one way or the other. You're either a slave to sin or to righteousness. We were slaves to sin. And, and to an extent, we still go back to that bondage. But that slavery has been broken because Jesus Christ purchased us and bought us, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, I think it is. You were bought with a price by the blood of the Lamb. Guess what? You're not your own anymore. I am not my own. So when I face times of long days and travels and doing this and then and I'm thinking, you know what? I'm, I'm only doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Even if I do this, big deal. You're doing what's expected of you. So I can't brag about anything. Amen. I don't think any of us can be bragged about anything. No. So when you look at the word... Lord next time, and you look at the word servant, this is going to change the way you read the Bible. Yes. Because you're going to see slave. And Jesus is your master. I don't think that's an accident. I, I don't know why translators like the word servant because it was less offensive. Guess what? The gospel is offensive. Yeah. It's supposed to offend. It, it cuts, but it does that. It cuts in order to heal. So I'm going to turn to Luke 16, and I'll... I'll try to stay on this one chapter, Luke 16. And uh, I love what, and I sent Connie a message yesterday. I love this saying. This is the way we ought to live. Adrian Rogers, the late pastor, said, We ought to live as though Christ died yesterday, that he rose from the grave today, and that he's coming back tomorrow. Amen. Amen. That, that's a great perspective to, to look at it. And if you are a slave, you're waiting for that master to come home because. We, we have the wrong idea about slaves in the Roman Empire. One in five were slaves. Whole Roman Empire, one in five were slaves. It was amazing. And the slave was different from the servant. And so I guess I erased him too quickly. But a servant is paid and he gets home and he goes home. The slave, guess what? I don't have to worry. I'll say, where am I going to sleep tonight? Taken care of. What am I going to eat today? Taken care of. You know. Uh, who's going to pay the rent? It's taken care of. The master's got it. We're slaves. We're not supposed to worry about those things. I still do. I'm still so human. <laughs> I face crisis at times, and, and we all do. But the slave was different than the servant because slaves... Remember the Roman centurion who sent uh, to Jesus said, My slave is sick. And he want, he did, loved his slave so much that he was willing to go to Christ. And here he's a Roman centurion because the slave relationship becomes end up more like a family member. In fact, when they earn their freedom, they become part of the family. And they were often adopted. And the slaves' children were their children, the masters too. So slaves were very endeared. You'll see that in the New Testament where slaves, my slave is, can you help my slave? Because that's, so that's the relationship that the master has with the slave. We are Christ's slaves. A slave is like Joseph who was a, what do, you, what do I want to call it? He was a steward for Potiphar's family, right? He was, a, he was a slave because, remember, he got bought and he ran Potiphar's family. And Potiphar began to uh, be attached to them, the family. They got closer together. Uh, he was a steward of Potiphar's goods. In Luke 16, 1, and then I'll go through uh, verse 13. He said to the disciples, Jesus, there was a certain rich man who had a steward and had an accusation that was brought against him that this man was wasting his goods. So he said to him, what am I hearing about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can't be a steward any longer. Then the steward said within himself, what am I going to do? My master is taking my stewardship away. And I cannot dig. I'm ashamed to beg. This guy never had a real job, maybe. He's never known what work is like. So that he's kind of panicking. I know what I'm going to do. Verse 5. 
So he called every one of his master's debtors and said to the first, how much do I owe, my, how much do I owe your master? A hundred masters. So he, he cut that in half. Then he said to another, how much, and I'm in verse 7, how much do I owe you? A hundred measures. So here's, here's your bill. Just pay 80 of it. These guys like this idea, this discount. This is like a Sam's Club deal all of a sudden. You need to just get your discount by mass quantities. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. Jesus said, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. Let me explain what that means. Jesus explained it actually, I won't need to. Make friends for yourself by the unrighteous mammon that you have or your wealth, or the, or the possessions that you have, that when you fail, that means when you get old and you can't work anymore, that they may receive you into an everlasting home. That's, that's sharing your resources, giving to help others hear the gospel. That's what that, this is what this is about. In other words, use money that you make, you know, and money is not the word, uh, is of all evil, all kinds of evil, yes, but all not evil, all evil. He wants us to use our mammon when we get old to, that we can receive others into an everlasting home. Verse 9, what I think means, and I heard Dr. McGee say this one time, and I think Dr. McGee and other evangelists that are dead now are still receiving people into the everlasting kingdom from their ministry and whoever supported that ministry. That's what this means. They may receive you into an everlasting home. That's the kingdom of heaven. That's, that's heaven itself. So many hear the gospel and are saved due to the resources that we spread. That, that's what he is saying. Use your unrighteous mammon to use for, to receive friends into the everlasting kingdom in, in the heaven. So Jesus said, whoever is faithful in what is least is faithful in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. If you've only got a little, it doesn't matter. If you're faithful in that little, you're going to be faithful in not. He goes, you know what, I've seen, if God looks down from heaven and says, I've seen him, he only had, there's a guy, uh, Bill gets only a little bit of money from his church, and he puts one dollar, he ties. I believe in that too. And he only puts one dollar in there. He's faithful in the little. So someday, in the kingdom of God, he's going to be faithful in Lot. He's going to be entrusted in Lot. He goes, you know, I can trust him here. There was a story of a man, and some of you have heard this, forgive me. A two-cent pat of butter lost him an $85,000 job. Let me tell you why. He got hired at a high executive job, very well-paying job, and, and the executive board says, let's go out and celebrate. Let's go down to this real cafeteria. It's really nice, like a home style. So they went there and they let him go first and then the CEO's right behind him and they're waiting in line and they're going behind. Then all of a sudden, he notices the guy that just got hired slipped a two-cent pad of butter under his napkin so they wouldn't see it, he wouldn't pay for it. The guy behind him saw it, he goes, I think we hired the wrong guy. He cannot be faithful in little and how he's going to be trusted with $87,000 and a $400 million budget or whatever. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? How, how that works? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what he was finding out is no servant can serve two masters. He will hate the one and love the other or he will be loyal to the one and hate the other. You can't serve God and money. You can't do it. It's just either money is your master or Christ is your master. If your money is your master, you're bowing down to it and it's because it's providing all your needs and it cares and everything you do. But if Christ is your master, everything you've got and everything you do is taken care of for one thing. Matthew 6.33, seek the kingdom first and I'll take care of where you sleep tonight, what you eat tonight, where you're going, uh, all, all of your needs, not your wants, but all of your needs. So really, we are only stewards, and I'm not talking about just money. I'm talking about your time, your talent, and your treasure. The, the, those three things you have. You may not have a lot of this, the money, but you do have a more time. You may not have time, but I know you've got talent. Nobody's been called into the church without a gift. Every one of us have got a gift. Absolutely, probably more than one. So that is 
if you're not if you're using those talents, those gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are for the church, uh, then you're investing and and you're sowing back into the kingdom. So, just re just to remind you again, the few times the authors wrote the word slave or servant is where slave should be. The only time then they wrote slave or servants, we are servants, is when we're serving one another. You know, I'm sorry, I like you, I love you a lot, but I'm not going to be your slave. I will serve you, but I have to reserve that for Christ. He is my master. I can take an inventory about everything I have. We were talking about contentment this morning. I, I, I started writing down a list of all the things, and I was not content. And, and I said, God forgive me. Look at all these blessings that I have. I was not content. And, and then I realized, you know, he, my, the master gave me all of these things. I had nothing. But the most precious thing is the relationship with Jesus Christ. There's nothing else that compares that way at all. So let me close in this here. Jesus had, uh, at one time, this is the example I was telling you about, entered Capernaum I'm gonna, uh, in Matthew chapter 8. Jesus entered Capernaum and that centurion came forward to him and appealed to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. Here is a Roman centurion, and it's a slave, by the way. See, in, in your translations, it probably says servant. So Jesus agreed to heal him, but the centurion doesn't think he is worthy to have Christ come under his roof. What humility. And I think that's what we, we talked about in the Sunday school. Maybe that's the only reason that, that Paul would have ever came to uh, faith. He had to be humbled. Bam, I'm going to knock you on your, on your rear, almost said that. On your rear. <laughs> and I'm going to bind you. And now what do you think about persecuting me? No, he wasn't persecuting uh, Christ literally, but he was in the body because of Christ. If you're persecuting uh, him, uh, we're persecuting Christ. Then, and then I'll say, that the centurion doesn't think he was worthy to come. He says, and listen to that. I'm a man under authority with soldiers, and I say, go here, and they go. Come here, and they come. Guess what? They better. <laughs> and he comes, and he goes. But my servant, and to my servant, then it says slave. Remember, slave. Do this and do that. That slave has no choice. So the word servant is not in the text. In the parables, when you read the word servant, put in slave. When you read about Jesus' reference to Lord, put in master. See how it all ties in. We are slaves. We are not our own. We were purchased, and it was a pretty expensive. For us, it was nothing. For Christ, it was everything. Slaves were more than, than just property, okay? Slaves were considered part of the family. And the reason we want to be slaves to Christ, not simply servants, is because he owns us. So let me say this last thing about slaves. Just for a, just for a job description for you. Here's your, here's, your, here's your job and my job description as a slave. Okay? I like what Paul said. He bear, bore the marks of Christ. Of the slave ship. So you could tell uh, by the marks on bar, uh, Paul's body. I'm curious to see if those marks survive into the glorified body, like Christ's nail print hands. I wonder if some of those marks don't remember. The last few things I want to tell you about slaves. They surrendered all property and possessions when they were purchased, everything. They had complete and total surrender and submission to the master, or they died. Servants cannot, uh, this, slaves cannot choose their master. The master chooses us. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because you were bought with the price. You were chosen. Ephesians 1. You were chosen from the past. Yes. Servants can choose their masters. I don't like this guy. I don't want to work. He, he eats with his mouth full. He grinds his teeth. You know, I don't like the guy. Slaves have no choice. They're owned by the master. Servants can quit. Slaves do. They're dead. Slaves would receive uh, new names, by the way. In Revelation 3.12, it talks about we're going to receive new names. If you have a new name, I don't know what it is. It's going to be interesting. 
But if you write the name, and here in Revelation 3, 21 it says, he's going to write his new name on us. I don't know what that name may be. But putting a name on something means ownership of it. Right. I had to write my name on stuff, you know, when I was in high school or, or when I'm at the office because people would, it would walk away and grow legs on it and walk away, so I heard. So I wrote my name on stuff because writing a name on something infers ownership. So Revelation 3.21, that's why he's going to give you a new name because you are his. I am his. You are not yours. You're not your own. We've been bought with a price. Amen. And... Let me turn this one last verse, Colossians 3.23 to 3.24. I can, I can remember that Romans 12.1, though, at the begin with. Slaves are, should do this. They should present their bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service unto God. It's reasonable. That's what slaves do. That's what slaves are supposed to do. Colossians what? Close Colossians what? Colossians 3, <coughs> 23 through 24, and I'll close with this. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Servants, obey in all things. Let's rewrite that. Slaves! Obey in all things your master. See, you can't be a master and be talking about a servant. The servant says, you're my master. No, I'm not your servant. I'm out of here. But wait, servants, no, slaves. Obey your master in all things according to the flesh. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. I backed up to verse 22 and I beg your pardon. And so whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, not unto men, knowing that of the Lord, the master, it is from the master, you will receive your reward of the inheritance. For you serve, you are a slave of the Lord Christ, of the master Christ. But he that does wrong shall receive the wrong where he has done. And there's no respecter of persons. There's neither Jew nor free nor like or free nor male nor female. We are all one in Christ. All one slave. So interesting that when slavery was thriving and they wrote the, the, the translations of the Bible, even most of the, the King James, remember the best translations, they still put the word servant in. And there's a huge difference between a slave and a servant. I'm a slave. I got nothing. You got nothing. We are nothing except for Christ. Amen. So be his slave. Remember, he owns you. What you got is not yours. And that's why I want to leave one little sim. The giant sequoias in California have been growing since the time of Christ. 200 feet tall. Their roots are 10 feet shallow. Alone, they cannot stand. But because these juvenile trees have intertwined their root system with one another, they support one another. Hmm. And if we are not in this group and we don't support one another, guess what? Bam, we're done. It's the only way that these trees have survived since the time of Christ is because they're connected and interwoven and they need, they draw moisture, they, draw, they help trap nutrients. Alone, they wouldn't have even survived. It would have survived 200 years. That's what the, that's what the arborists tell us, the experts tell us. So we are these, these huge trees that we need to be intertwined and connected with one another or will fall. And by the way, he doesn't own the cattle on the hills, only he owns the hills. He owns it all, including those people of us on the hill. Glory to God. Let's be his servant. Amen. No, let's be his slave. Yes. I praise God for you and thank you. Father, thank you for so much for opening this truth up to me. I have, I have no clue 
about what that relationship really was. And we are only uh, slaves to you, and, and yet you have redeemed us and purchased us with the most costly of things, the precious blood of the Lamb of God, yes. who all of us have deserved the wrath of God, yes. yet because of your kindness, you extended your love and gave your only son that you would give him his life as a ransom for many and to purchase us. And we belong to you, God. Help us remind when we read the word servant and the word Lord, you are our master. We are your slaves. And we ask you to be with us and to help us remind us this week in the holiday season to be slaves of your righteousness and not to be slaves of sin no more. We ask a blessing on those who are not here today and upon those who will be with us this week. And we ask your blessing in the holy, righteous name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Pastor, can I make an announcement? Sure, go. Uh, um, for the singles, I'm going to have Christmas over at my house. I don't know what day or time yet. Um, but.